Welcome to CBAW Loves, a book club podcast from Community Building Artworks. I'm Seema Ressa. And I'm Amelia Bain. Each episode, Seema and I will invite a rotating cast of fellow writers and artists to discuss a book that we love. We hope you'll read along and join the conversation. Welcome back to CBAW Loves. In this episode, we're joined by three returning guests, Tarfia Faizula, Amber Flame, and Rachelle Heath. They share their thoughts on this month's book, Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. The book, which is part biography of biologist David Starr Jordan and part memoir, sparked an incredible conversation about the power of naming things, dark nights of the soul, and of course, whether or not fish exist. We hope you enjoy our discussion with Tarfia Faizula, Amber Flame, and Rachel Heath. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited about this conversation. This is like one of those books that I'm just like always pressing into people's hands and I'm super stoked to talk about it with you all and hear what you thought. Me too. Um, You know, we usually try to come in with some questions, but we felt like this book had so many potential jumping off points. So we just kind of wanted to open it up to like, what kind of book did you think you were reading? And then, yeah, what happened for you as you were reading it? Well, I'm happy to start because... um... I love Lulu Miller's work on uh, Radiolab. And so I was stoked. I was like, oh, this is going to be a great book. And then when I saw who she was kind of planting the seeds into, this Star Jordan figure, I was like, we're going to talk about a white dude. I don't want to do that. It was a journey. We went on a journey. And and I liked the way the book like started to dismantle this idolatry that she had around this person. Rachel, I feel like both books we've brought you in to talk about have taken you on such a journey. So thank you for um for like sticking with the books to get to that that dismantling that you talked about because it comes like you know ways in to this book. Yeah, mm-hmm. it it took a while, and I kept saying. I like this person's work, so I'm going to keep reading it. And the writing is beautiful, you know, and there's so many different stories that are woven in there. But every time we came back to him, I was like, dude is an asshole. Like, I don't care what he did to like name shit. And like every, everything that he named, like even his naming of things was like, I was like, come on, colonizer behavior. Like, like, let's just, let's, why, what are we doing here? I came into the book being like, oh God, I'm going to have to think in a way. This is not an escape book. This is not a quick book. Um, In that way, um, it was really quick. I was surprised at how, even though I was like really resistant to the character that, to this guy, I was like, and I didn't know Lulu Miller's work. So it was cool when her story started to be woven in, it was just, just soon enough to keep me being like, okay, where are we going with this? And I knew because I count on my friends to make me smarter. I was going to get something. I was going to be smarter because of this book. It's nonfiction. Gag me. You know, like this is like Seema's getting me to regularly read nonfiction. And so I'm more open to things. And I'm like stacking up nonfiction books on my own now. But it did make me feel like I wanted her to not be obsessed with this guy. And so by the time her doubt started creeping in, by the time she started making the connection to her father, that moment where her father was like, nothing that I was like, I like as a depressive, I was like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> like you got to get there. Where's the, and her like longing for that hope was just like so relatable that from there I was like, if she gets it from this white guy, then bless her. I will take it. Like, I'm fine. Okay, I'm in. And so I kept reading for that. And I was not prepared for how it just suddenly was like, or maybe he's a total dick. And I'm like, you're right. And and so the unpacking of her own need became the most fascinating story really, really quickly. And I love that. I had no idea what I was getting into. Like, I didn't read anything about it. I didn't know Lulu Miller's work. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't read. I didn't look it up to see what I was getting into. I was I was surprised by how blown away I was by it, I guess. I also got invested in her relationship to the subject matter. And I think if it had been like a straight up biography or an straight up autobiography, I think I would have been way less invested. But it was really fascinating to see her perspective shift and the way she sort of 
you know, um, keeps making those left turns, like you said, Seema. Uh, the way I feel about him is sort of, you know, I, I kind of, I, I really hear you, Rachel, on this sort of just like, I don't want to, we already have to, you know, this is already such a, a, a white man centered world we live in. Um, but I found myself not invested in his story necessarily, but sort of fascinated by how little is actually known about, I guess, that kind of history. Like, um, you know, just, I was like, I think I, I was I vacillated between, well, of course he was like this. And I also though found myself rooting for him, which was very fascinating. Like I was sort of just like, I wanted to him, I wanted him to transcend his own ceilings, I guess. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wanted him, I, and maybe I'm rooting is not exactly the right word, but I felt this kind of like, oh, man, he turned out to be that kind of dude. That sucks. But I also think that she did a really beautiful job of capturing those contradictions that I feel that are inherent to me, too, you know, like kind of like my own problematic thinking that shares space with my efforts to transcend my own ceilings, to use that phrase again. I was also struck like what you, when you were talking about that. Yeah, that's making me I, I was like, mm, but on mute. Um, yeah, I wanted redemption. Like I was like, maybe there's going to be another turn before the end of his life. And he's going to be like, what the hell? I was so wrong. Um, I but when you were talking to I was thinking like how conditioned we are to want the mediocre white man to have some answer that we didn't know about or something like like I was like, you're what she paints is a picture of a mediocre man who could not succeed and so created his own path, which was remarkable. Um, and yet was like given thing, like, like that, that litany of, of ways that he just kind of rose after a certain point was really telling. Um, and so then he's put in this position of authority, but I'm like, he's a murderer. We're guess we're thinking yes. But even just like the little things that she would slip in about like how much of his own, you know, his allergy to ethanol and formaldehyde. And so how much of his own dissecting or handling of, spe of specimens he actually probably did. His use of especially young boys, young um, uh, boys of color in different countries to actually catch things, poisoning the tide pools to get the fish. Like, what? Um, so I think the clever way of revealing the villain in this story was... was um, was felt like to me unpacking also our conditioning to think to hold this this white man up um to have the mountains and the buildings and the statues and the books and all the things named after him right um so i was thinking about like right maybe we were we're trained to root for him we're trained to be like but he can't be all bad right so there's a going to be some kind of reversal or something that will prove his his value again and then we don't have to disregard his art or his his work or his whatever and and like our just our societal tendency to want to do that for people that we've admired for any reason at all or history has admired for any reason at all i don't know how much y'all have been following the submersible it's interesting to think about that just that kind of that tenacity and that ambition and how over time his ambition which in the early stages I admired, right? Like as somebody who I see myself as also ambitious. Um, and Amber, like you said, sort of forming, the idea of forming your own path or whatever, but then watching that ambition get bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more damaging. And then just thinking about the hubris of people who have that outsized ambition combined with access to resources, which goes back to what you were bringing up, Rachel, about that sort of like part of the frustration is that sort of like, you know, I think so many of us who are in marginalized populations are just dying for that access to those resources, right? Um, which is often denied us in, in a lot of different ways. So it was really fascinating to think about yeah, just that sort of like that line that I think she also kind of acknowledges between the studies she was bringing in on positive illusion, illusions. And I was like sending screenshots because it was on Kindle and I was reading on my phone. So I was like live tweeting to see why like this part, this part is really messing me up or, you know, and I sent some excerpts to friends too about sort of the power of positive thinking, which I really struggle to um, 
manifest. I saw this Romanian writer not that long ago say life is wonderful um, at a reading he was doing. And I was sort of like, I've never thought of it that way. <laughs> like I've never been able to access that particular filter. So I've been trying to lately. <laughs> and it's just like, I'm like, this is tough. It's really tough to see life as wonderful when you have been sort of like, you have to fight so hard for, you know, basic necessities like freedom, you know? Um, so anyway, this is all to say that I guess I was sort of thinking about that line that she sort of draws where it goes from the power of positivity to, oh boy, now we're murdering people. And now we are contributing to, you know, like we are an early proponent of eugenics, which eventually leads into, you know, feeds into World War II and, you know, genocide. And that pipeline is crazy. And then just thinking about these five men who were just like, I'm really rich and and now I'm dead because that story of Icarus, I guess, like by flying too close to the sun because of your own hubris. Yeah. I think too about this thing that you and I ta have talked about a lot, Tharfia, is this idea of like, do I have the freedom to be free of my identity and get to do my work without it? Right. And that is that is a very particular, <laughs> very small subset of humans, white men get to perhaps just create work, you know, this privilege of like not having your identity mixed into it and to get to like take those risks and have access to all of all of the resources that come with like not having the answer for who you are at every turn. Um, and sometimes I've thought like, well, if I, you know, like if I could just like live in a cabin in the woods, of course I could write something really good. Right. If I wasn't washing everyone's damn socks, but like attention to other people's socks and my own is part of, I think what I like about my work, what I like about my point of view. I feel that Seema, what you're saying of like, how freeing would it be to be able to create just to create an absent of my identity. And I'm like, even when my identity is often the reason why I'm awarded or um, given opportunity to create is because, oh, well, we're going to support this, you know, these stickers of identities right now. And so that's why I got this resource or this grant or a residency or whatever it is. Um, so like, do I want to be free? That's like such a, that's such a real question. Like, or, and, and what is, what could that possibly mean? And is there like a way to be free in the creation with, without being free in the society, without being free in the, free of the identities themselves? And when do we create just for ourselves? Could we take that? Like, could we have the hubris to be like, I'm going to name fish and I'm going to categorize them according to my own idea of how they relate to each other and it's going to be based on my observations and questioned by nobody and I'm going to name them after me you know <laughs> like could we and what would it take to have that kind of like what would it take for for black and brown women what would it take for queer people what would it take for black and brown queer people to like have that freedom to just claim it name it it's like of course he's naming fish because <laughs> nobody else is naming fish and he's like I'll take fish, you know, like, what can we take to claim like that? Um, and is there a freedom of, that is there a freedom of creation outside of identity? See, I want to push back a little bit because I don't see this act of naming as being creation. I see it as a power move, like 110%. That kind of move which I, I can't call it creativity because it doesn't feel like it. it it felt very destructive and it felt very ego driven does it feel good to be able to call this by some scientific name does it give me something some kind of connection or would it be okay to get rid of that and to actually like see the creature know its behavior be in community with it in whatever way I could to see what ultimately we see in the conclusion, which is that fish don't exist, that they are beings that are related to other beings in ways that we could not see before because we were like, I know what you are and I'm going to name you. I've been thinking about this a lot, like 
around this idea of naming things? Are we improved by having a name for magnolia flowers or not? And I keep coming back to this, the Mary Baraka quote, to name something is to wait for it in the place you think it will pass. What having a name for something, you know, in this whole book is about having what having a name for something does for us in terms of creating order in the chaos, even in being able to like name the kinds of love that we want to have. I can look for that. I can long for that. To Amber's point of like, I, I do feel like it's a moment where people are naming things, right? For themselves. <laughs> Maybe not being like, I'll take fish, but <laughs> kinds of relationships and kinds of love. And I just feel like there's like new language popping up constantly for dating and for interactions. And and does it hurt us to have gotten the benefit of the order during the time we believed it, even if it doesn't hold? later because there are a lot of stories that have told myself that have kept me that now I know aren't true but I couldn't have I couldn't have survived that shit if I had known I think what she did so brilliantly too in the book is talk about how naming gets stuck and how we don't we like as a group of beings related to each other it turns out you know we don't once people started naming things, it was really hard to stop that train. It was really hard for, and people still believe those things like that, that tied to Charlottesville and that like the whole um, neo-Nazi movement was really, really beautifully done because of that, because like, it's still stuck that there's something inherently unrelated or um, that what happens, you know, what is, what is very much, uh, circumstance and and nurture, not nature, um, is still somehow in, 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 like, I even think about, like, we're now talking about, like, the po- po- I, I thought about the post-traumatic slave syndrome, right? Like, and talking about how trauma is carried in our, in our genes, in our blood, um, and, and that inheritance. And I'm, and I'm like, like, basically, it reminded me to be really, really suspect of science. Like, science named science i'm like oh remember they're just questioners that don't have answers and they come up with an answer and then they continue to test it and they might say we found an answer but to re- to remember that like the best science is one that is is always questioning whether it's right whether the conclusion it can be proven over and over again um and we forget that because like we stopped taking those kind of science classes remember like the hypothesis and you had to put the thing and the da, 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 the form you had to fill out. We stopped doing that, most of us. And so we're just kind of waiting to hear, do we need naming? Do we like need order? Um, I think about what you're saying, Sima, of like the different, we're coming up with different language all the time now for relationships, for identity, for how we want to be perceived in our body or or named in our body, I would say. And like, what is it in us that requires some kind of order to sit into or some kind of name system to understand. And, you know, the older folks being like, so they, them, he, he, I I don't know, you know, like that whole thing. And it's like, you do understand. You just have been believing this way for so long that shifting it, just like Genesis are still there going, no, 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 it's science. (laughs) Um, People are still going, it's a fish, you know, like it's so hard to change our minds but there's something that needs it maybe. And that's what I, I, yeah, that's, that's what I'm sitting here going, do we have to, do we have to name? I think we do as the bigger the group gets, the more we need names to figure out what the subsets are or where we belong or what the village is. I think that's a space of comfort. And I would also say that naming gives the illusion of order. It makes us feel again comfortable I know what this is living in a world where I can say this is a door this is a wall this is a book it helps me communicate with people around me but when you get beyond the surface of that it's it's a collection of particles it's you know it's got a chemical construct it's got there's so many different ways of naming something and it has order in all of those different like planes of understanding it 
And really what it comes down to me is if there's an infinite way, an infinite number of ways of knowing things, I haven't really named it. I've called it something in order to be able to interact with it, which is not really the same to me. My dad is a gardener in his retirement. Um, and so he was walking me through his garden and I was sort of like, what's the name of this? I mean, I'm a writer. I always want to, you know, I, I like to know the names of plants, especially I just think the words are so beautiful sometimes. And my dad was just sort of like, knew a lot of them in Bangla, but not in English. And he was just like, I don't know. And he kept saying, I don't know this one in English. I don't know this one in English. And I don't know, you know, like it was great. Um, and there, there was something so cool about that to me because I don't, you know, like I think both my parents, Kusima has met have really, they're, they're very Bengali and they have stayed very Bengali in a lot of ways, um, especially on the language level, I think too. They, they know English, they can get around, whatever. So I, I was also thinking about how we live, in, English is so interesting because it is such a diagnostic language in a way. And I mean, I think it's part of the culture too, that we're always sort of self-diagnosing, like, you know, like I'm always, you know, like, like casually scrolling through TikTok. I apparently, you know, have ADHD, I'm neurodivergent, probably have an eating disorder. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I, and I think like, um, those are words that are shorthand, like you were saying, Rachel, for something much vaster and much more complex, which is really my relationship to myself, my relationship to the world around me. Since our last book club, when I was just like, fuck yoga, I don't care about yoga. Like, you know, just because, like, you know, because I was like, it's not for me and I'm really angry about it. Um, I started really thinking about that. And I've been doing yoga for like a month, like pretty much every single day. So and I, and I had this like whole journey about it. Um, because I was sort of just like, I had been so angry for so long at these white girls co-opting yoga and always saying, you should come to a yoga class with me. And then like talking to me using, you know, terms in Hindi, which I do not know because I'm not Indian, I'm Bangladeshi. So, and the frustration of that, of being seen as, you know, an Indian and how important the naming of Bangladesh was, for example, in terms of it being its own, you know, culture and, and um, language and all of that. And how at the end of the day, I don't think anybody can take anything from me that is already mine, I guess. And I thought about that too, you know, with this book, like just thinking about how I felt really galvanized, A, to sort of like continue to live in my delusions and to max out my delusions, you know, like, because I don't think I'm going to get anywhere close to, you know, eugenics. Like, I'm, I'm quite sure that there's not too much damage I can do with like the larger, you know, so I'm just like, man, I got to really like max out all my delusions. And I also feel sort of like the, the excitement, I guess, of, of the fact that fish exist. I mean, those creatures exist, we exist, whether you call us human beings or not. And the other thing I was sort of thinking about is how that moment where he, you know, like where the reason why fish don't exist is because it's a problem of vision. It's a problem of sight. It's, it's a problem of a lack of discernment, you know, like it's, it's that you have judged an entire group of beings because they look more or less similar, right? Versus, and, I, and how often do we feel that way? It's sort of like all lumped in under this one, you know what I mean? Kind of like unseen in our, in our distinctions, unseen in our, you know, differing perspectives, like, you know. Um, so I, I felt very thrilled by the reminder that, that naming both sort of does and does not matter in a way that sort of like the universe continues on whether I have the words to describe it or not, which is also maybe a little daunting because I'm a writer and I, I make money literally describing what I see. So then, you know, I was sort of like, what next? But, but I think that question of, it was really cool to have that question of what next, you know, after, after reading this book, because I felt changed by it in a way that I wasn't really expecting. You said something and I, I have to like circle back to how it made me feel. <laughs> Because you were talking about gardening with your, your dad and he said, I don't know the name of this in English. And I was an English teacher for many years and I saw my students say, I don't know how to say it in English, almost as if they were giving their power away to know a thing because they couldn't communicate it in the target language. And so I think another thing that this fish existing or not existing, however you want to look at it, 
is confronting is how we give away our understanding of something because we can't name it in the appropriate way, right? Like, maybe I want to call them fish. And maybe that's how I know them. And there's like power in that. And there's knowledge in that. And maybe these other folks want to call them something else. And that's okay, too. Those understandings can coexist. And it doesn't mean that I have any less knowledge than someone else. It means that my knowledge is different. And I have a different level of access, a different layer of access to this thing, whether it's calling it in a different language or calling it by a different name. You know, like kids, when they're learning things, they make up names for stuff. And we give them the name that we call it. And that's, you know, great because then they can, you know, live in society and people will understand them. But what power do we take away from the thing that they call it, you know? that has meaning for them. And that's what I'm sure the the Japanese boys catching the fish, like they knew what to call that thing. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the different places he traveled, it wasn't like they had never seen this. They, they weren't discovering a new species of something. They were like, oh, that's a thing that we probably eat or don't eat, don't catch to eat. Um, and, you know, that's safe to eat. That's not, you have to cut it this way. You have to prepare it that way. Like, Every time we open it to, you know, it's such a such an amalgamation of languages too, because we literally do not have enough words, and other other cultures and languages had words, because that's this is their daily experience. In the same way, you know, like yeah, I, I went there too. Of like, yeah, they're they're they already have words for it. They know what to call it. They just don't know what to call it so that you'll understand. And that's actually. Um, in that way, a weakness on our side, <laughs> not a weakness on their side. You have a name for it. I don't. So what is the name for this? It is like, say it so that somebody else will understand it is like, right, the business we're in and so much of the work that we're doing, right? It's like, I want to name this in some way that you'll also experience what I'm, I'm experiencing here. Um, and what I loved about this book is like, I think one of you said this earlier, right? That it wasn't just a straight biography. It wasn't just this straight memoir. It was, she was building up this person at the same time as she was building up this story of herself and the story of the, she called him the man with the curls or the curly hair, curly haired man. And then it, like, it all tumbles down and she tumbles with it but if she didn't make us believe it the tumbling wouldn't matter so I, feel, I want to come back to the positive thinking thing and her dad being like nothing matters no one matters but treat everybody like they matter and I want could you talk more about the part of that that you wanted to talk about yeah I've been I, I think like I have a very realistic father my father is very steeped in realism he's he's sort of he doesn't read fiction he watches the news and he reads science and he reads religious texts and that's pretty much my dad's jam right and then my sibling and I and even my mother you know we love stories and you know so I think um I guess I bring that up because my father doesn't think stories matter and I think they do but because I'm his daughter, like I, you know, like I have inherited that realism that also borders on cynicism, you know, like the, the line between realism and cynicism, I think can be thin. And like I said, like, I think reading this book converged with a few things I was, I've been practicing already because I think, you know, like, I don't know, like a lot, of, in a lot of ways, like it's, it sucks to be a brown girl in America. It's just hard it's just hard, you know, like, and it's hard in a lot of ways. And you're fighting a lot of um, categories that you would not put yourself in, but that other people put you in and the assumptions that come with that kind of categorizing or whatever. And so I think my reaction to that was to be like sad and angry for a long time and to sort of like, continue to, you know, cultivate my relationship and therefore my attachment and therefore addiction to my own suffering, you know, and then also, of course, like, if you're a POC writer, you are rewarded for that, you know, like the publishing industry is like, oh, tell us, how, yeah, tell us how bad we hurt you, you know, like, 
tell us again, you know, like how, you know, like, were we so bad? Were we so bad to you? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just awful. <laughs> so, so I think recently, like I have felt a lot of, um, we keep talking about freedom and, and one of the quotes that lives at my desk is a quote by Toni Morrison, where she says, freedom is choosing your responsibility. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways, like I struggle with that. I struggle a to give myself choice in the first place. So that's one thing, right. And then taking that another step and choosing the responsibilities you want to show up for is another. So I guess like, I just recently, I was just sort of like, I'm so bored and tired of my own sadness and suffering. Like it's, I'm the one who is, you know, like, and it's not to say that naming those things doesn't feel good, but I feel like to go back to detachment, Rachel, like, I think like I needed a a kind of like a, a healthier, um, way of regarding that suffering. I, I don't know, like, I, I feel like I'm very much in process right now in the middle of sort of like upheaving the way I think about things, which is really, um, I can't always get there, right? Like, because programming, deprogramming, like you were saying, Amber, like, change and changing our, you know, like changing our position is like, nearly impossible especially if we're invested in that position especially if we're being paid for it you know but I've noticed that my happiness um seems to or you know like whatever I don't even know if I believe in happiness but um but I guess I do believe in sort of satisfaction and I think I'm just trying to like cultivate that and this book was sort of like oh yeah, this actually has some impact, you know, like it's a terrible, it's it's not like, oh, I'm so inspired by this dude to be delusional. But, you know, I think it's more sort of like, why, why do, why have I let them have that? Why have I always let them have the big dreams and given myself only the small ones, you know? Amelia, you've been real quiet. What's, what came up for you? Because you hadn't, you just finished this book last night. I did. Yeah. The ending of the book, the talk of like what you gain when you accept that like fish don't exist, that part of it. Um, Tarfia, you earlier were talking about uh, like TikTok telling you like, I guess you have ADHD. I guess you have, you know, all of these things and these these labels. What came up for me is I both at one point have been diagnosed as having ADHD, but also studied it. I think about how my sense of self has been like impacted by that diagnosis in in useful ways, but also in like limiting ways. I was talking to someone recently about like, oh yeah, because you know, I'm like kind of a mess and my spouse is like very put together and they were like, that's not my sense of you at all. It was like a mind blowing thought of like, wait, really? Because that is how I move through the world. Um, And that name and like the labels that come along with that name. Yeah, that's what came up for me reading the book. Yeah, she writes at this in this ending passage, to turn the key, all you have to do is stay wary of words. This idea, right, of like, yes, okay, that might be convenient shorthand for any of these reasons that Rachel named, right? So we can name them to each other or whatever, but like to stay wary of it seems kind of exhausting also. (laughs) you know and I think there's some of that that balance between like the laziness of the not nuanced story version of the story and like just like just it's easier that's so real like I I I feel like my whole life comes back to my mother's dissertation my mother was a philosopher and a philosopher of language and that's what she studied for most of my life And so we grew up with like logic questions around like, essentially, what do words mean? And her dissertation was my first big editing project um, as the labor (laughs) um, of words came upon me. Um, And it was very much about like common language versus individual language. And so when you say something, do they mean what you mean? Do they understand what you mean? And how do you like, how do we come together to common language? And especially when it's constantly shifting ground. Um, And like beyond the like kind of sterile sort of philosophical pondering of that, like comes the really, the really true impact that we all are sitting here under of like how things have been named in our, in our societies, in our various societies, globally, how, how things are ranked in this order. Like, I, I, I just, I come back to that, like, 
it is so hard to change the tide once we have a name for something. You know, we can say race is a construct that doesn't exist and in the same breath talk about how much we love our Black people. You know, like, it's like, and yet... And and yet we, I come back to like, what do we need of this? What what do we need of this to be in community? And I love that she talked about community communication, all that stuff. So um, I'm just like pondering this, like, w- like you said, Rachel, do we, do we need this? Or are we, is it just comfort? Um, that really like put me back on my heels. I've been thinking about it ever since. Um, I also wanted to like, I think that this is secretly like really just a story about heartbreak and thinking that there's only one person in the world for you. And if you fuck it up, that there's, there's no better mission to devote your life to than trying to make it right. Um, and, and the debunking of that on a very personal level was also really like a, a beautiful under note to, and I've been like, my my new book is a love story. And so I've been talking about lover and beloved and what it means to be in the, these roles. And, um, and so I was, I, I kept being hooked by the cinnamon scented curly haired man, you know, like I was like, I was like, and when are you going to like, when are we going to talk about that healing? And I think it was lovely that this other thing was actually like mileposts in that healing or that opening too, which is a healing of like family of origin, feelings of shame that were coming up. Like, like the way she talked about her sisters and, um, and, and her perception of her dad's perception of them. Um, that was right. Like, like you hear him using words and you think they mean something and you see and are reading expressions and assuming that that's his truth about somebody else and so must be his truth about you too like that was really wild to see how like convoluted we get in trying to name ourselves um in trying to understand how our parents have have um manipulated the story maybe a little bit and like coming to that realization too it's just like that's all floating in my head right now like is this really about like, is this really a coming out story? Happy Pride Month. You know what I mean? Like, it's really like, actually I'm gay. And it wasn't, it wasn't because I must self-sabotage the great love of my life by kissing this woman. It was actually because I wanted to kiss women and I wasn't ready to accept that about myself because I didn't think my dad would accept it about myself. And my dad reminds me of this white dude who has all the power to name fish in the world. Um, right? Like maybe it's that too. And that was, that's really cool to see it from that angle. Yeah. She was trying to like take another obsession to give herself some space from this obsession and to somehow like she was trying to look at this story of like putting the fish back together as this example of the thing is not to change. The thing is to say who you were, you were, I'm loyal to this man. And I'm, this is like, this suffering is now who I am. But the idea that you can be the protagonist in several different story arcs that have several different like happy endings and then maybe something else, but right, like can have, you can find happiness in all of these different ways. I think, you know, it wasn't until I got divorced and was like, okay, well now I have to have a different story because I just ended that one. And it felt, you feel really unmoored because you're, I, I think something tells us that we are, perhaps it's society, um, that we are allotted one story. And she is like, well, I guess my story is longing and regret at fucking up my one story. But there's also like, we're not supposed to live this long, right? Like they're talking about this with monogamy and all this stuff. Like it's easy to say you got to commit to this one partner because you got to pump out some kids so that you can work the farm before you die. You know, like those kind of things. Like I also think about what she was saying about the human hair, you know, like the the length of human existence is as long as a human hair and the like vast timeline, like her dad, like kind of laying this out of like our insignificance. And like, I think that the longer (laughs) humans exist, the more we're complicating, trying to name things, trying to categorize, trying to, you know, be, be like, we found the answer and off we go running in that direction towards this is the cure for this, or this is how we solve that problem. And then there's also like our own individual lives are are now running longer. And 
everything we were taught about how stories go now have a like, but for how long am I going to do this? Like, <laughs> like, do I, I'm going to get a job and work it my whole life. You say my whole life, the one job. Um, why, you know, like there's this, the why of it, like it's, it's, um, it no longer is the answer, the, the natural answer that science has found for us of what things can be. And so, yeah, the unmooring is like realizing that it's passing quickly. It's ultimately individually fairly insignificant, no matter how big of it, like Beyonce's impact on the world and human history is insignificant. And we're like, it's Beyonce. Like if Beyonce can't make a ripple, then what the fuck am I going to do? You know, like. I, I don't think we can underestimate how much of like the naming that David Starr Jordan did and like the building Stanford and putting up statues of his mentors is like, um, like a fight against that feeling of and reality of insignificance. Like it's, it's like, oh, but I'm, my name's going to be on this mountain. My name's going to be on these fish. And that's so clearly the motivation to do that. I want to, I want to come back to the, the chapter of the relationship ending. The, the way I read it, like, yeah, she was upset about the relationship ending, but I think she was more upset about not feeling like she was a good person. And that's why we see the projection onto the friends. What will they think of me? I was the good girlfriend. That was the name she had given herself. So how do I get to be a good girlfriend, a good partner, if I'm someone who has cheated? That's another label that is kind of convoluted in this context as well, right? I didn't necessarily feel like the relationship was the thing that she was clinging to as much as the I want to be a good person and I've done something bad and I need to find a way to clear, clean the stain so that my friends still like me so that the people around me don't have see me with the scarlet letter on me. And it's another label that doesn't serve her, right? What does good mean? I really, I really feel that that question of morality and sort of the way that you outsource your own sort of value system to others and allow them to be the one who designate, you know, the points. Oh, Seaman, I've been talking about unlikable narrators. And I love, I love unlikable narrators so much more than likable ones. You know, I love myself so much more when I'm unlikable. People like me more when I'm unlikable. It's really, you know, like it's, it's really weird. Like, um, and I, and I think for a long time that, you know, yeah, I, I, I there were years where I, I fashioned a very um, convincing cutout of myself that was like, a you know, the presentation of goodness, I guess. But I hadn't really done the work at that point to actually do that. You know, poetry and writing gave me a way to access a deep desire I had to be kind, but not necessarily nice. You know, like it gave me a place to practice that. And then being able to do that in that world, you know, meant that I could maybe bring some of that to my family or to my friends, places, my personal life where that was harder to do, you know, where, you know, like I was, my birthday was this weekend. Um, we went out to my sibling and I went out to brunch with our parents and um my sibling was asking my parents to tell stories about me basically. But, um, but it was funny because when I was in high school, I was just, I, I would steal money from my parents and I would spend it on all sorts of crap, like combat boots. I once stole enough to like install a car system, like a, a whole sound system in my car. Like it was really, it was really next level. And, um, and I don't, and I, and I think like we were able to laugh about it in that moment but there were years where I wouldn't acknowledge any of that you know like I just pretended like that any of that n that none of that ever happened but I was an asshole you know like I was really like but I was I was the I was worst to myself I guess and so this is all kind of like a long winding path to you know go back to Amelia something you brought up which is what you get when you give something up and I think what I got when I gave up the idea of myself as a good person is that what I gained was the idea of myself as a complex person, which gave me so much more and allowed me to give so much more to the people around me too, you know? Cause I think that everybody goes through phases when they struggle and to 
touch on what you were saying, Amber, about the, the, you know, the scope of things. Like I would never do that now. Anything I did when I was 15 or 16, like I can't even fathom, you know, like I might like to take money from rich people to like give to other people, but that's, you know, like, I think like I have, you know, like, you know, like, I guess maybe that's the thing too, that you kind of over time can kind of um, press against your own kind of ascension and find that you actually haven't changed. You've just like rerouted or relocated. There's this thing you're saying, which is like, yeah, okay. So I'm not, I'm, I'm maybe better than I was and I, but I'm also not attached to goodness as a construct. This is the thing about an unlikable narrator. This is the thing about reading somebody like confessing that they like fucked up and feel terrible. And even there are reasons for wanting the to make it right are not right is that I feel like really seen by it in a way that maybe most of my life does not allow me to allow myself to be seen or like it, what you were saying about like like people like me best when I'm unlikable it's just like yeah just like all 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 the time I spend inside my head activating villain mode just for my own like pleasure like one thing I like to do is hug somebody but then stare angrily into the distance they don't even know that it's happening (laughs) but I imagine if there's a camera somebody's like she's plotting something I'm not I'm really like I don't have time to plot anything (laughs) but I'm just like I like just like giving myself that thrill there is I don't know is this a writer thing I feel like I have like the invisible audience um especially when I was younger I was like you know like when I was doing them crazy cool tricks into the pool each day there was an audience that was like 10 10 10 across the board like come on I knew when I belly flopped like I knew when I got bad scores from the audience like there's this sort of sense of like what if God is watching us like what if there is an audience that's like clocking the things. And I, so I love this idea of playing the villain towards the audience just to be like, what's going on in there and in the side to the audience, you know, kind of thing. Um, but this like wanting to be like that moment. I remember that moment too, where I was like, man, I have totally been an asshole. I know that I am capable of great villainy. And I'm not, I'm not talking like, I'm not talking like, I don't have the guts to do it. I'm talking like I am capable (laughs) of great villainy and I choose to not act villainous, (laughs) but I know that I'm capable. And I think it takes knowing that for you to like really, I don't know, like to be loved as a whole person, to engage as a whole being is to know that like what you're capable of and like to be able to look yourself in the face. And I think the great denier that David Starr Jordan was of of his true villainous nature is is one of the things that, that she's drawing out. Like, yeah, like, it makes sense that we'd get there because it's like, right, you if if you were just this whole complex person, which is what we get the picture of him as it's like, wow. I mean, he did do some kind of cool things with his power and his, um, his, you know, privilege to do so. And he did some really messed up things. And he did some things that are not, you know, like when you're talking Amelia, I, was, I had Hamilton line in my, in my head of like, I want to, I want to build something that's going to outlive me. And like, don't we all want to feel like we could have that kind of impact or, or mark on the world? There's this like wholeness that she was seeking to, I think. And that's what, that's what I really like. I love a good, happy ending. Good job, Lulu Miller. I hope that you and your emerald eyed girl are still living your best life or whatever. But like it was, it was a more interesting story when she was figuring out how to accept, like you were saying, Rachel, like how to accept these new words for herself that were what other people knew to be true because of what she did. And so I think when that's the thing, Tarfia, that like when you accept your villainy, when you accept that that is also a side of you and that so much of it is conscious choice, it it doesn't allow you to whitewash anybody else either because we're not, we're not fish. (laughs) Like like fish don't exist. (laughs) Like I'm tying it back, but I'm like, wow, like, She really took us on this journey. I see why you wanted to read the book. (laughs) Well, I just wanted to chime in to say I'm also a prolific reader of um, 
unlikable narrator books. And if I'm able to root for this person who is like, not, not great doing some questionable things, I think it makes it, I can accept more of myself, like a more complex view of myself and still like root for myself, you know, and, and forgive those things a little more. I feel a lot of gratitude for, for books like this one where she, she exposes the cycle of it. She keeps doing her work through it, which most of us who experience the world this way do, right? Like your emails, maybe you're forcing those exclamation points, but like you're doing it. <laughs> you're doing the things that you have to do, you know, to, to Darfia's point about like c- coming short of positive psychology or like a positive glass half full outlook is that it's so lonely because nobody wants to hear you. Like I've been telling people in the past week that I feel worthless because it's been one of those weeks. And like, nobody really wants to particularly hear that. (laughs) Like, it's like, right. There's not, and it's not like anybody can do anything about it. You go through the cycle, you feel some sense of rejection or loss or whatever the thing is. And you're in your dark. Yeah. I think reading something like this is always uh, just a fucking relief. I have to say, I was never very curious about people who don't have regular dark nights of the soul. (laughs) Like when she started going into like, oh, and psychologists believe this and that people with like my, like my father are, you know, grit and resilience and hubris. And when she started going into that, I was like, oh yeah, there are like, I was reminded (laughs) because I'm surrounded by a lot of artists. Um, I was reminded that there are people out there who like this sort of happy go lucky going, you know, like like purposeful or whatever you want to call it and they don't have these or maybe they do or and you know like her going into the like the danger of that bubble bursting for them and how it can be so much worse than people who regularly confront their feeling of worthlessness or whatever um and yeah I was like I was like oh this is what it taught what it told me (laughs) What I think I got from the book was that like essentially people who go through life without that um, are lying to themselves, are, are very good at lying to themselves. And um, some lie for their whole lives and some encounter midlife crises or a sudden deflation in their ego because of something happening or whatever. But like essentially it is a falseness to think that we can survive this human existence um, without the dark night of the soul, without like confronting the the darkness of like, am I worth it? If, if I'm meaningless, if life is meaningless, then why am I here still? And why work so hard in a world that's trying to kill me often? And so uh, Tarfia, I think of you're like, you're saying, I don't even know if I believe in happiness. And you just kind of threw that off. And I'm like, can we circle back to that? Like, what does it mean to like, have a happy or joyful exist like is it like is it freedom um I, I wrote down freedom as being able to choose your responsibilities I'm like well yes and we're we're black black and brown people are not going to get to choose their responsibilities probably in this lifetime um right so like I'm, I'm really like sitting with that as like if it's if finding a place where we can maintain a state of happiness, not darkness. I don't know if that is no longer real or the goal, if that's been like shown to be a falseness, grit, resilience, bouncing back, all of those things are not going to save us. What is, you know, like what, what, what is the goal? What is the purpose? I mean, I would say that what I perceive to be something that would save us is being willing to sit with the darkness is being willing to do the shadow work is being willing to see the value in all of the experience. And I think that a lot of that comes back to being able to remove the labels that we put on it to being able to say, I'm not going to qualify this as being terrible or terrifying because then I don't want to look at it and I don't want to touch it and I don't want to talk to it and I don't want to know it. And then it's going to consume you, you know? But if I can step back and say, this is a part of myself, this is part of my experience, what does it have to teach me? I think that 
that is part of the the solution. That's part of the way forward. I was just thinking of the near the end of this book, the the two women in Lynchburg, Virginia, that Lulu goes to to interview, and you know the taking care of one another and allowing others to take care of you. That being the like thing that keeps keeps them living, and that there's meaning in that. I'm so glad you brought that part up, which I'd forgotten about. That was so devastating. That was such a devastating passage to read, Um, especially, and and I think it converged with this other thing that I've been thinking about, which is that, I don't know when I started saying this, but a while ago, I started saying we need each other. And I don't know where the, when, when or why this phrase kind of, you know, I think for a lot, I mean, I'm a firstborn. So I was just like, I have to do it all by myself all the time and nobody ever recognizes my efforts and you know like so I you know what I mean like so I think like I I think I have uh you know idealized my own independence and my own you know solitary whatever and so I I think that moment was so beautiful to read about how what keeps them going is kind of a desire to make things better for each other you know like it wasn't it, it wasn't this awful thing happened to her, right? Like she was sterilized against her will. And it wasn't like she was like, that turned her into the kind of person that made her say, well, I don't care what happens to anybody else. If it happened to me, it should happen to you. Cause then, you know, like instead she protected this girl from that happening too. And I, and I think that that companionship and commiseration and care they found in each other, you know, I mean, I do think that we are, we are worth living for as it pertains to how we end up living through and with and among each other. I want to shout out the the new Spider-Verse movie um, for anybody who hasn't seen it yet, which is so good and covers some of this, including, you know, multiple dimensions and different versions of the same story and all of that kind of good stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, the idea of your purpose not being your purpose, but your purpose being, you know, connected to the purpose, purposes of other people's lives was really a profound call to arms, I think. Um, And a profound reminder of the fact that, you know, like there are these figures like Davis R. Jordan is so, you know, in sort of like in a way adamant about his being a monolith, you know? And then what happened is that he lost everybody. He lost all those kids. That was crazy to me. Like how many kids he lost in his lifetime and how many people he lost in his lifetime and how, you know, like it just drove him further and further into, you know, becoming the kind of person who then wanted to eradicate other people, you know, like versus embrace them is really... I don't want to be like that. You know what I mean? Like, I love, I, I want to use my villainy, you know, and my pettiness and my vanity and my desire for vengeance for other ends, you know? So I think like, I, I wanted redemption for those two women, you know, like I wanted revenge for them, I think, because I was so angry reading about what had happened to them. And then instead of it being about redemption, what they have for, what what they find is sort of like, care and that was just very humbling care <laughs> yeah like it, yeah it's incredibly fucking humbling that's where we ended was you saying that and i'm like right but if it only comes down to the way in which you connect and remain connected and care for and are cared for by others that's the only thing that yo I can work a lot less on the things that I'm working on. <laughs> like th- maybe that's the freedom. It's like, this isn't important because this isn't about care. This isn't important because this isn't about care for myself or someone else. That's just like, like I'm going to really sit with that. Thank you. It is humbling. It is humbling. Thanks for listening to our discussion of why fish don't exist. A huge thank you to Tarfia Faisula, Amber Flame, and Rachelle Heath for being part of this conversation. 
We want to hear what you thought of why fish don't exist. So email us at cbawloves at cbaw.org to share your thoughts. Next month, we'll be reading The Secret to Superhuman Strength by Alison Bechdel. CBAW Loves is a community building artworks podcast produced by Amelia Bain with music by Rose Blakelock. CBAW is committed to mission belonging, reconnecting veterans with their communities. For more information, visit our website, www.cbaw.org.